it all began in a garden with our Father. He made us to be satisfied and to express the joy of his presence by building his city. But we wanted life lived on our own terms more than we wanted life in his presence. So we ran. We wanted control, but became controlled. We wanted power, but became enslaved, crippled and paralyzed by the hellishness of life lived apart from the Divine Presence. The disease of self-rule still has all of us, and we experience it every day, in everything we do. But Jesus came to give us back what we gave up. Jesus made a way for us back into the presence of God. In His presence there is fullness of joy. Life lived before the face of God is life lived in the unshakable and unalterable reality that our Creator, our Father, delights in us and invites us to abide in Him. As we experience the joy, delight, life and light of Jesus' presence, we begin to find the very same with each other. The love of Jesus is transformative. The light of His presence changes us to be with Him in all we do. And He invites us deeper. It's God's delight to invite us into the process of our own transformation into Jesus' image. A new identity entirely wrapped up in His delight over us. This formation confronts every impulse for life lived on our own terms. But joy is our fuel. The joy of His presence strengthens us to run after Him, to become like Him. And we live to give all we are and all we have for an even greater joy still set before us. Together, we are transformed from one degree of glory to the next. And this glory, this joy, this ultimate good that is life lived in His presence being transformed into His image isn't just for us, it's for the world. It's a return to the garden with our Father, except that the garden has become a city a new city where death is no more. That's why we exist to know Jesus and to make Jesus known. And that's why our vision is to be a people humbly pursuing Jesus' presence, being continuously formed into Jesus' image for the good of our city as Jesus' kingdom comes. Good morning, Westside. Please stand with me if you are able for the reading of God's word. Today's reading is from John chapter 15, verses 1 to 13. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch of mine that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, 
and my words abide in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lays down his life for his friends. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, church. Laura, thank you so much for reading that for us. Um, we are in a series walking through our vision as a church, uh, what it is that we believe that God has laid on us as his people. And it's really not unique to us. We're not trying to be innovative with this vision. Uh, we're actually trying to just return to, to the ancient road that, that Jesus uh, walked, that he laid down for us to follow him on. And so uh, we've been in this series together uh, the last few weeks. And, and um, man, I just got to say, like this series for me uh, has been a lot different than what I had planned for it like many months ago when we looked at doing it. Uh, as we've come to this series, there's just been a burden, uh, a really sweet burden, but a burden that the Lord has laid on my heart and on the heart of our elders, uh, the hearts of our elders and, and many other people on our staff team and, and all of us together together. Uh, just, just for the church, just for us as Jesus people in this city, who we are, what we're doing, more, more than anything, that we as a church would be uh, aligned with our mission to know Jesus and to make Jesus known. That's our mission statement. We say it all the time. We exist to know Jesus and make Jesus known. But, but how do we make sure we stay aligned with that mission? How do we make sure that an actual living, breathing relationship with Jesus stays at the very center of what that means, like to know him? to really know him, to, to love him, to want to wanna be with him, to want to wanna be made like him, to want to wanna be obedient to him, to want to lay our lives down in love for each other the way he laid his life down in love for us. And so these three values that we're walking through, uh, Jesus' presence and image and kingdom, are, are really, we're, we're bringing these to you and saying, hey, these are some metrics. These are some evaluative parameters that we want to use as a body in everything we do to ensure that when we say we exist to know Jesus and to make Jesus known, we're talking about relationship with Jesus, the living God, first and foremost. We're talking about loving him, pursuing him, all that. So that's what this is about. Uh, I'm excited about this week. We're in the second one of our values. Uh, third week of our series, because we did an intro week at the beginning. But, but the second one of our values, Jesus' image today, I want to talk about what that means. And again, different from what I had planned. I wanted to get, I, I, I had a whole different direction in mind months ago. And then now, I'm really just, it's one note that I feel like is on my heart to hit with us as a church. So that's why we're in John 15 today. Let me pray for us, and then we'll, we'll begin walking through this. So, Father, we love you. And we are so, so thankful Lord, that our love for you um, is a result of you first loving us. Our love for you, God, is just, is just an overflow of who you are, what you've done, and what you've poured into our hearts. And so, Lord, would you please stir us up as your people? Would you stir us up in our love for you? Would you make your son, Jesus, the most important reality in our lives? Would you, make, would you make us a people passionate about Jesus? Passionate because, Lord, we know that Jesus is the revelation of you, our Father. We know that your Holy Spirit points us to Jesus and everything he does. Lord, so we want to fill our hearts and our minds with this embodiment of your love for us in Jesus. And so we ask for it, that you'd make us a people, Lord, who know Jesus and who live to make him known. And as we look at these three values, God, would you please speak? Whatever is not of you, would it just fall away and would it just be would just churned out and whatever it is of you, Lord, would it land in our hearts and find good soil? I ask this in Jesus' great name, uh, amen. So two weeks ago, as we began the series, we did it by going to Revelation chapter 2 in Jesus' words to the church in Ephesus. Uh, and we saw that Jesus in Revelation 2 commends the church in Ephesus for their good works and their toil, their patient endurance, their holiness and their discernment. But he also called them out. And he called them out on having all those things together and yet abandoning love. 
It's having all those good things, yet abandoning love. And he said, unless you humble yourselves, unless you confess your sin, turn back to, to your love for me, your love for each other, I will come to you, Jesus said, and remove your lampstand from its place. He would diminish the light of his manifest presence among his people, among them as his people, which is, again, the primary reason behind these three values. Look, unless, unless we actually keep a relationship with Jesus at the center of all that we do, the, the church, this local church is nothing more than a, than a not-for-profit with a Christian theme. And I, and I just want you to know, like from the bottom of my heart, I have zero desire, zero desire personally to, to lead a, a non-profit with a Christian theme. Like I have zero desire for that. I, what I want personally, and I hope it's what you want too, I want to be a part of a church like a real church, a church where all the body parts have come alive, where, where the body itself, you are walking in your calling, in love with Jesus, seeking him, pouring your life out for him and in love for those around you. Like I want to be part of a living, breathing, functioning church. And, and, and look, bodies are messy. Like it's a living organism. We're meant to be a living organism. And I'm okay with the mess. I will embrace all of the mess, but I want to be a part of a church, not just an organization with Jesus as kind of our main theme. And that's what Jesus was after with his people. It's why the church exists. And, and I've got to just tell you, you know, as we've gone to Revelation chapter 2, I wasn't really expecting even to open the series there, but as we've gone there, I've just got these words of Jesus ringing in my ears because Westside, we are a lot like that church. We have good works and toil and patient endurance. We're, we're pretty good at, at not tolerating those who are evil. We've got some good discernment, but how about love? Like, how about reverence and awe? How, how about the fear of the Lord? Like, a real fear of God. Because we just see him as he is. Anytime in scripture somebody sees God, like, has an encounter with the, even an angel of the living God, they're full of fear. The, the, the fear of the Lord is the very beginning of our wisdom. It's the beginning of us knowing how to live, what to do, who we are, how to see the world. And as we've talked about last week, I, I wonder sometimes if Jesus, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, has already looked at us, and if maybe, you know, we have, with, by truth, without love, by Christian activity without relationship, if we've quenched and resisted and grieved the Spirit long enough that maybe our light's been diminished to a certain extent. I have to wonder about that. That's why we're rolling out these values as we do this first time with, with a call to confession because even if, even if our light is diminished, even if that has happened, even if we have been about truth over love or, or activity over real relationship, even if that is true, we're not without hope. We've got a whole bunch of hope because the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases and his mercies never come to an end. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. These are his promises. Jesus wants a confessing people, people who aren't hiding and who are free to be honest about who they are because Jesus loves, desires, lives to revive the humble. That's what he loves to do. And I want to be one of those people that he revives. And I want to be a part of a church that he revives and restores to us our love. So what, that's what we saw last week as we looked at our first value, Jesus' presence. We saw the presence of God among us is literally the point of all of creation. It's the, it's the whole storyline of the scripture. It's the reason the church exists at all. We saw that every Christian is meant to be empowered by God's presence, that we as a church in this city are meant to be a people of Jesus' presence in Vancouver. And here's the thing about life in Jesus' presence. Here's the thing. See, life in Jesus' presence isn't a static reality like it isn't it isn't static it, it, it isn't it doesn't just stay still it isn't just theoretical this is this reality of life in his presence is dynamic and it's meant to change us it's meant to change me it's meant to change you something happens to Jesus people as we live in the presence of God to use biblical language, we are transformed from one degree of glory to the next. And it's why our vision doesn't stop with humbly pursuing Jesus' presence. No, we want to humbly pursue Jesus' presence being continually formed into Jesus' image. 
We don't want to stay the same. We want to change. As Jesus' people, we always want to change. We always want to be transformed from one degree of glory to the next. We don't want to just see lost people come to Jesus in this church. We want to see Christians disciple to maturity. We don't want to see converts made. We want to see disciples made. And Jesus' presence is actually the key to our formation, and which is something we see so clearly in the text Laura just read for us, John 15. That's why I want to take you there. Listen to what Jesus said to his disciples in John 15, 4. Abide in me, he says. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus wants you to hear one thing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Without his presence, without abiding in him, We can bear no fruit. Like whatever it is you think that God wants to do with his church, in your life, in my life, apart from abiding with him, none of it will happen. None of it. As we set this vision for this local church, it's a vision to put away all man-centered and man-made religion. We want to put that away. It's a vision to tear down spiritual strongholds. Satanic spiritual strongholds. It's a vision to see captives set free and Jesus worshipped in this church with abandon. It is, but one thing is clear as we look at John 15, the only way there is abiding in him. Abiding in him, which shouldn't be surprising to anybody who's spent any time in the scripture. I know it's not all of us, but anyone who's read the Bible will, will know that. I mean, listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 11, 28. He said, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Listen to his words, church. Jesus says, come to me, and I will give you rest. That's the first part of the call, and it's where we tend to focus most of our energy. This coming to Jesus. But he doesn't stop there. You know, he goes on to say, take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And then he says, and you will find rest. Two kinds of rest Jesus points to. A rest he gives when we first come to him. And a rest we find as we take up his yoke and learn from him. The sad reality of the church today is that most Christians stop after that first rest. And it's not meant to be the totality of your life. Most Christians point back to one single season, one short-lived season in their life as a season of rest, a season of abiding, a season of really knowing him and living that life with him. And it was at the beginning of the relationship. And after that, we, we, we move on and we try to content ourselves with the reality that, you know, that rest is just a short-lived kind of thing. And then you move on and God expects you now to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and, you know, act like an adult and take care of yourself. It's actually not true. There's that initial rest when we first come to him, but then he expects us to take up his yoke to learn from him. The, the, the word Jesus uses in John 15 is to abide in him and find a continual rest in him. That's the fruit that we bear in the Christian life, rest for our souls. Rest for our souls. As Andrew Murray says, rest for the soul, does it not imply deliverance from every fear, the supply of every want, the fulfillment of every desire? West Side, look, a a lack of rest in our souls is plaguing Jesus' church. It's an infection in the body. And if it's in one of us, it affects the whole body in the same way that when you get an infection in your foot or in your leg or in your arm or in your neck, it affects the whole body. Your entire experience of life is affected by one part being infected. And the reality for Jesus' church is that a lack of rest in our souls is plaguing us. We experience so little deep rest in Jesus often, even as Christians, that we think we have to look other places to find that rest. We think it just can't be found here. And so we give up. And we listen to sermons. We take our kids to church. Half of us, 
Half of the church even signs up for community group. Less people actually go, but half are signed up. And still no rest. See, we can delude ourselves with just enough Christian activity. We can delude ourselves with just enough Christian activity to start thinking that the problem is not in my spiritual life because I've got just enough Christian activity that that's actually not a problem. I'm, I'm good in that category. It's just not powerful. Please hear me on this, family. Coming to Jesus is incomplete unless we stay with Jesus. That's what it means to abide. Coming to Jesus is incomplete unless we stay with Jesus. And staying with Jesus is not accomplished in Christian activity. Christian activity, worship, like we've sung this morning, sermons like we're doing here right now, worship and prayer night, like, nights like we have on Thursday, community group, Sunday school, all these other things that we do, they are meant to be supplemental to your abiding, to support you in your abiding in Jesus, your own personal love relationship with him. Your own personal staying with him. Your own personal wearing his yoke and learning from him. Sitting at his feet as your teacher. It's what a disciple literally means. To follow him. To apprentice under him. To learn how to live life from him. And all that activity without your own abiding is as empty and as dead as the worship of any other false god. Our works can become a false god. And Jesus, as we've seen, is not interested in a church with great works, but no love and little relationship. Westside, too many of us have learned to believe that rest for our souls is theoretical. Too many of us are trying to be transformed in our own strength. Too many of us have tried to get better and failed for so long now that all the Christian life is, is the maintenance of a thin veneer of spirituality laid over top of years of built up shame, subtle but built up shame. And this series, this, this moment in, our, in the life of our church is a, is a call to just to destroy the veneer and be honest about where we are and who we are and what's going on in us. We cannot get healed until we get honest. And this is one thing that I just so love about this church is our honesty. We are an honest people. But we need to stop hiding from each other. The lack of deep abiding in Jesus, I mean, it just must be something that Satan and his demons just celebrate every single day. They must celebrate that every single day. I mean, our preoccupation with the stuff of the world born out of our belief that the Christian life is a subcategory of what we really exist for. I mean, we're going to have to explain that to Jesus when we see him face to face. Because he, he didn't seem to know anything about that. Our vision for this local church is, is, is not that. Our vision is to be formed into the life and image of Jesus by the very presence of God with us as we abide in him. I, I, I mean, and I want to give you a snapshot of, of what that looks like. I want to take you to one verse from John 15 that shows us the power of abiding in our transformation. It, it's not a verse that gets a ton of play, but, but listen to what Jesus says in John 15, 7. You'll, if you've read the Bible, this will sound familiar. Um, if you abide in me, Jesus says, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Now, maybe at first this verse doesn't scream what we're talking about, but, but hang with me for a second. It's really important. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. It's the kind of verse that we've learned to sort of write off as unrealistic or explain away as, you know, not sound not meaning what it sounds like. I mean, it sounds like Jesus saying, if you abide in me, ask for whatever you want and I'll do it for you. That's what it sounds like Jesus is saying. But that doesn't really work for us because A, we don't want to think about God as some sort of cosmic genie and B, you know, we cannot conceive of a world, many of us, where the fulfillment of our deepest desires is actually on tap. 
like on tap, like just pull the lever anytime you want and fill your glass, like pull the lever and fill your cup to overflowing. The fulfillment of your desires is on tap. We can't conceive of that. We feel guilty just for thinking it. So let me encourage you right now not to write this verse off though. We have to be careful not to write Jesus off here, especially when he repeats himself three times like he does with this. I mean, a chapter earlier in John 14, Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. Very similar, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So he's already said it three times. Here's the fourth. A chapter later in John 16, Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Now, these texts used to bother me a whole lot. I remember reading one of these texts, I think the John 15 one, when I was a kid or hearing it read and thinking, okay, this sounds good because there is something I want. And back then, this is a true story. I remember what it was. It was one of those Power Wheels things. I wanted the red Jeep version of this plastic car that could be inside my house that I could sit in and drive around the house. This, to me, sounded like paradise. I could not imagine anything better than that car. And here's what makes it even more intense for me. My cousins had one, and they also had a motorcycle version. Like, no joke. So I went to Jesus, and in his name, I asked for this car, and I got nothing. I never got it. The car never came. I even resorted to asking my parents and they said it was too expensive and we couldn't get it. So I thought this whole thing was a sham. When I was a kid, I heard this text and my focus was on the things that I could ask for. And actually, if if I'm honest with you, and I try to be honest with you, if I'm honest with you, this has been um, one of the biggest issues in my entire Christian life is going to Jesus for his things. Good things. Good things that I think he should want to give me. Like going to Jesus, for example, for specific spiritual gifts. Going going to Jesus for renewal in his church. Like go, going to Jesus just just to just to experience to make a, to make an impact in ministry. Like we go to him with good things. To get maybe even more personal, I mean, for Missy and I, you know, going to him for children over the last 13 years. Good things. And verses like this seem to encourage that way of thinking that you come to me for the things and if you ask in my name I'll give them to you but you have to know this about these texts Jesus wasn't focused on the stuff here his focus wasn't on the stuff his focus was actually in an entirely different place listen to him again in chapters 14 and 16 Jesus says whatever you ask for in my name in my name. Now, to ask in Jesus' name does not mean that you tack Jesus in Jesus' name onto the end of your prayers. It's not some magic formula that makes you get whatever you want. You actually don't even have to do that if you don't want to. You don't even have to end your prayers that way if you don't want to. It's, it's not a rule in the church or anything like that. But asking in Jesus' name, what that means is that we ask in alignment with Jesus' character, nature, and will. That's what it means to ask in his name. You ask in alignment with who he is. And then notice this, in John 15, verse 7, the first text we read, Jesus said it a little bit differently, and this is the key. He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. 14, 16 says, ask in my name, whatever you ask in my name. 15, verse 7, he says, ask whatever you wish. Church, Jesus is saying that if we abide in him, if we stay close to him, if we wear his easy yoke and let him teach us how to live our daily lives, life in this world, if we will actually follow him as disciples, something will happen to us. Our deepest desires 
asking whatever we wish, our deepest desires will become aligned with his. We will literally begin to take on the will of God as our own. And something amazing happens in this place, but in this place, but before like any behavioral modification, before you go try to do anything differently, before you try to not do that one thing anymore and start doing those other things before any of that, we start here with abiding. Just being with Jesus, just knowing Jesus. This is where the transformation comes from. It is the transformation of our will. Jesus is saying that if we will abide in him, we'll start to desire, start to want what he wants. If we'll abide in him, we'll start to love what he loves. We'll start to hate what he hates. Anyone who abides in, uh, abides in him will be transformed at the core of who they are. Right, right down to the very center of that thing that motivates us in everything we do. Our will your will will be transformed. You'll only want what he wants. And here's the thing about wanting what he wants. I mean, I mean, this is, this is obviously, first of all, where, where real formation, transformation into his image starts. It's the kind of life where we see the world the same way he does, where our deepest desire is for him to have his way with what's his, where guilt and obligation don't motivate us at all, just joy and love do. But what happens when our will becomes his is amazing. All of a sudden, we step into a place of limitless power to have whatever we want most. I did not just go prosperity gospel on you, I promise. We step into a place of limitless power to have whatever we want most. When your deepest desire is for the sovereign of the cosmos to be glorified, to have his way, to do what he wants, and when all you want to be is a vessel for his purposes, you step into a life of limitless power. When you are so, so completely satisfied by life, abiding in Jesus, just being with Jesus, that anything can be taken from you. Everything can be taken from you in this life. Family can go away. Houses can go away. Careers can end. Everything can be taken from you in this life, but you are satisfied in Jesus. And when all you want is to abide in him more, and for those around you to abide in him more, when that is all you want, you can ask for anything you wish, and Jesus will do it for you. He promises that over and over and over again. This is what we're talking about. This is the vision in front of us of being a people formed into Jesus' image. It's not to be a people who are really good at just spiritual practices, disciplines. It's not to be a people who are really good at Sabbath. It's not to be a people who are really good at doing things or really good at living a certain structure, a certain way. It's way richer than that. It's way deep. It's to be a people who know Jesus, who live life in his presence, who abide in him. And out of that rest of soul, church, out of that rest of soul, out of that satisfaction that he promises for those who abide in him. It's where we're so satisfied that we stop looking to the darkness to fill us up. It's where the world loses its hold on us because we've just been, our thirst already quenched and we don't need anything from the world. And its allures are not that powerful anymore. We start praying our prayer, his prayers along with him because our hearts are aligned with his. And the only way to describe a life like that, there's only one way. You just call it fruitful. That's what Jesus called it. It's just fruitful. And as we bear more and more fruit, as our fruit grows more and more, the Father's glorified. It's rest for our souls. It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It's all these things born that we see evidence in our relationships with each other, with ourselves, with the, with the living God. Can you imagine family, a church like that, a church full of people who just love more than anything just to abide in Jesus? Can you imagine if this church 
this local church was just every single one of us who, you know, who calls Jesus Lord God and King. When we say that, we didn't mean like he's our paradigm. We meant like he's the love of our lives. And it's the one that we just chase and pursue and just want to be with. Can you imagine if that's how we spent our lives? Can you imagine if he was so important that we started every day by going to him just to be with him? And can you imagine if we all came together once a week, a people like that, to worship him together? All those little fires, all those little lights shining for Jesus. Can you imagine if we came together every week? It'd be like a bonfire just to abide in him together, just to love one another in his presence together. I mean, this is the picture in front of us that we're trying to cast. It's the only vision for this local church that we as elders know how to cast. I don't know how to give you a five-year vision with a certain numbers everywhere, like this many churches planted, this many people saved. I don't know how to do that because I don't see it anywhere here. This is what I see here as Jesus called for his church. It's a people humbly pursuing his presence, being continually transformed in his image for the good of our city, for the good of the world, as his kingdom comes. It's the only vision I know how to lead us in. The question is, how? How do we abide like this? And with the rest of our time, um, that's what I want to look at with you. How do we do it? How do we abide in, in Jesus? How do we wear his easy yoke? How do we learn from him every day? And it's really, really simple. I, it's so simple. It's so simple that a child could do it. And that's really important. It's so simple. A child, unless, in fact, unless we become like children, we won't be able to do it. Like it is so simple a child could do it. We have to right now, especially us adults, we have to get out of our own way. We have to stop internal arguments in our head. We have to stop thinking around this and remember what Jesus said, unless you become like a little child, unless you become like a little child, that life doesn't open up to us, that life in him. We've got to become like children again, church, before Jesus. It's really simple to abide in him. But the first step, this is really important, the first step in our abiding is to acknowledge that this is an act of war. This is an act of war on the systems of the world and a complete reorientation of our lives. To abide in Jesus is to reject every other king, every other kingdom, every other power in this world as being ultimate. It's to reject every other pursuit as lesser until we lay down our lives, the lives we have planned for ourselves. We don't get to pick his up. And if you want to abide in him without laying down your life, it won't work. You're not allowed. It doesn't work that way. He's just decided that. Mark and I were talking about that this week and he made a great point. He said, we're all being conformed to the image of something. And he's right. You know, you walk past a billboard on Robson or the window of any store and there's an image there for you to conform yourself to. You watch TV or you wander mindlessly around the internet and there are hundreds of images for you to conform yourself to. We spend our money to be conformed. We wake up early and get to the gym to be conformed. We work hard and forget the Sabbath to be conformed. We dress to be conformed. We fantasize about being conformed with greater and greater effectiveness to all the images around us. All the false gods that we have set up, all the idols of our culture, even we as Jesus people fantasize about being conformed with greater effectiveness to those images. I mean, they don't hear or see or speak or live at all, but we still bow down and worship them because we're caught up, many of us, in the flow of Babylon's River abiding in Jesus is an act of defiance. It's an act of war against all of that. It's planting Jesus' flag in enemy territory. It's a rejection of every spirit but one. This is the entryway into real spiritual warfare, real spiritual battle. The enemy of our souls doesn't need to bother with us, with us as long as we're not abiding. But the second you turn your heart to start to try to abide in him, this is where we need each other to be lifting us up, to be interceding for each other. 
We need the church to see itself like an army of prayer warriors and intercessors to fight for one another if we're going to be a church who abides in Jesus. And it's why abiding in him begins every day with our very own surrender. We just surrender. Wake up every day and we go back to the very beginning of where life with Jesus started, to bowing down before him as Lord, God, and King. Let's not overcomplicate this. Just go back to where we started every day in a fresh way. Bow down before him as Lord, God, and King and just say, I surrender all I am, all I have. This day is yours, whatever you want. Whatever you want to do, I'm surrendered to you. My life is yours. This is where abiding begins. And we have to get into a habit as Jesus. People have doing this multiple times a day. It only needs to take 30 seconds. Like I just did it just now. It only, it's very easy. But we have to get into a habit of this. From there, we wait. We wait on him. Without taking some time in our day, without taking a little time for Jesus in our day, the reality of our surrender will not sink in. You cannot fight a war against Babylon, against the systems of the world in word only. You cannot worship Jesus with your lips only. If your heart is far from him, it doesn't work. We need to take a little time. Just be with him. And in this time, I would encourage you, do whatever comes easiest. If you're new to this, do whatever comes easiest. Worship him. What I like to do, I have, a, I have a chair in a certain place in our apartment. I like to sit in that chair and I like to put my earbuds in and I like to just listen to some worship for a few minutes and just let my mind adjust again back to the heavenly realities, heavenly things. I just listen to worship for a few minutes. Then I grab my Bible and I, and I read, either through my plan or I just pick up a verse. But I just, I'm there for relation. I'm not there to study. I'm not there to exegete. I'm not there to write sermons. I'm there just to be with him. And I know, I know how we want to push back on this, some of us. We are busy people and we just don't have the time. And we already have our boundaries set. No more demands on our time. We are maxed out as it is. We have rules in our families. No more demands in our times. Here's the weekly schedule. It is full. Nobody else gets to add anything to the family calendar. But can I ask you, church, can, can we put an end to all of that BS right now? Can we be honest with ourselves? Can we be honest together as Jesus people with what we're really saying? It's not really about our time. It's just not. We have limited time. We cannot get everything done in the amount of time we have. That is all of our reality together. But we make time for the things that we love most, for the things that we prioritize as most important. We make time for those things. We design our lives around those things. We adjust our schedules around those things. What we are really saying when we say, I don't have time, is Jesus is not that important to me or that enjoyable to me. And that's been my reality. Him not being that enjoyable to me. I told you about this last week, but here's the thing that Jesus put on my heart in this last season that he really convicted me of, and it's this. I have turned my time with him into a form of work. It goes back to that John 15, 7. Like, I'm going to him for these good things. Lord, stir something up in your church. Lord, pour yourself out on your people. Lord, change our hearts. Lord, have your way with us. Lord, I need you to do this. I need you to do that. I need you to do all these things. And I need you to do this in me and that in me and whatever. I, I, all these things I go to him for. And it, I began to be exhausted with it. Completely exhausted by all of it. Because going to him became a form of work. It was labor intensive. I couldn't handle it anymore. You know, Leonard Rave, Ravenhill in his book, Why Revival Terries, which I would encourage to all of you, it's, it will make me seem like a really tame preacher. You won't think that I'm so intense anymore. Uh, Le Leonard Ravenhill, Why Revival Terries, but he says this in that book. He says, you know, what prayer is, prayer is really just placing ourselves in subjection to the Holy Spirit for him to use us for whatever he wants to. 
That's prayer. Which is what we've just said is surrender and waiting. What we're talking about here, church, is prayer. Eugene Peterson, uh, he, he gives a really helpful illustration. He says this. He says, okay, so imagine you go out to a really great restaurant with somebody you really love. And, and imagine your night is like, and where you're sitting and everything. It's all, it's all arranged perfectly f- for a sense of privacy. You, you just get to be one-on-one with this person that you really love, this person you find fascinating, that you, that you care about. It's how Missy feels about me when we go for dinner, okay? Uh, so imagine you're in that place, and, and imagine the night is just really sweet, and imagine you're, you know, the, the night is a combination of, like, you're listening and you're talking, and, and there's, there's, me, there's periods of silence that are full of meaning, and every once in a while, the waiter comes to your table and he, he fills your glass up. You see, he, gives, he fills your glass up with more wine. Uh, he's there to help you. Anything you need, he goes and gets it for you or she. And they come back and you just served really well the whole night. You leave and you leave a good tip. And then you walk out of the restaurant and you're on the street, you know, with this person you love. And your conversation now is just, it's just casual. He said, it's a picture of prayer. It's a picture of prayer, but he says, Here, here's the thing here. Modern prayer is not like that. Like the way that most of us understand prayer is not like that. The way most of us understand prayer, and this is what I had been doing with God, is we actually sit down at the table across from ourselves. And God is the waiter. So we sit down at the table across from ourselves and we're, we're full of, what are my feelings? What do I need? And I'm looking at myself going, hey, Matt, what are you thinking about right now? What do we really need right now? What's on our heart right now? What's on our mind right now? Da, 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 da. And then we say, hey, God, we need this. Hey, God, we need that. Hey, God, can you run and go get this? And then you leave the restaurant. Maybe you thank the waiter. You leave the restaurant, but you forget about the waiter till the next time you're back in the restaurant. There's no relationship with the waiter. I mean, if your service was really, really good, you you might actually remember his name, but that's going to be about it. This is what I had done. And so abiding with Jesus was dead and lifeless and exhausting, and I began to hate it. I began to hate going into that place. Until, until I just stopped working and just went and sat there to be with him. Just to spend time with him. Just to sit there in worship or in silence or in reading the Bible or in prayer. Just to sit there and be with him like I'm across the table with him. Just because his presence is worth it. And those times for me now, they're, they're full of life and joy and they don't look a lot different from the outside, but my heart is completely different. Church, this is what we mean. And if we will not make time just to be with Jesus, let's stop calling him Lord because we're only fostering the infection in the body. We're creating dead, hard, dry skin over top of the infection, but the infection's still there underneath the skin. And what we need now is surgery. We need a surgeon to cut us and let all the old stuff out. We surrender, we wait. We do that, we can do those together every single morning. The last two steps happen as we live out the rest of our lives. We just avoid and pursue. We avoid Sin, we pursue his promptings. We, look, you don't need to know a lot here. You just need to start with what you know. Run from the things with your life as best you can. Run from the things you know he doesn't want for you. Turn to the things you know that he does. You don't need to worry about what you don't know. Start with what you do and he'll meet you in that place. Again, so simple, a child could do it. That's it. That's abiding. And it forms a really, really cheesy acronym that I love telling you about, that I'm borrowing from Steve Smith. Swap. (laughs) As in, this is how we swap our life for Jesus' life. There's more I want to say, and we will say over in the coming years, so I don't have to worry about getting it all in today, but, but that's what's most important for right now. 
as we move to communion, there are just two things that I, I want you to hear. First, this abiding in Jesus' presence, this formation into his image, it is not a solo pursuit. You and I cannot do it by ourselves. It has to begin in our hearts. It has to begin for us in that place with Jesus. But Jesus goes on in John 15 to say that as we abide in his love, as we keep his commandments, that, that we, sorry, that we abide in his love as we keep his commandments, then in John 15, 12, he tells us what his commandment is. He says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. Being formed into Jesus' image begins with a personal abiding in him, but any love for him will always overflow into our love for each other. Again, we will not abide unless we fight for each other, unless we love each other, unless we're in Christian gospel community with one another and we know our aches and we know our pains and we're praying and we're lifting each other up and we're checking in and we're making disciples of one another. Until the church begins doing that, the gospel we preach to the world is hollow. Don't, let's not try to pretend that we want to make disciples out there unless we're willing to make disciples in here. Being formed into Jesus' image is as much about us being formed into a people. Jesus people together as a single body in this city as it is about personal character transformation. And we'll talk again a lot more about that as time goes on. Second, I want you to remember that none of us has ever or will ever abide in Jesus perfectly. We'll never get it. We'll never make it perfectly perfect and we're not expected to. He doesn't expect you to. He doesn't expect me to. And it's good because I definitely don't. Only one person has ever tied their humanity together with perfect abiding in, in the Father, perfect love. And that's Jesus. He did it because every one of us has failed at it. And the incredible news of the gospel is that we get to step into his abiding. This is not the part of the work that we now do for him. This is the work that he carries us in. All we have to do is Take up that easy yoke of his that's perfectly designed for your shoulders to fit you perfectly without any pinches anywhere. To learn from him. To treat him like the Lord God and King that we say he is. And just go be with him. Just surrender to him. Be with him. Run from what he hates. Pursue what he speaks to you in his word or by his spirit or through others. And that's why this whole season, all we're doing as a church is just a call to notice. This is just a call to notice what's going on in us, to notice what's going on in the church, to notice what's going on in and around us, just to notice and to, to rip down the facade, to, to destroy the thin veneers, covering up those years of built up and subtle shame. And just say, we're done with that. We would rather be honest as a people about who we are and where we are and let Jesus heal us than try to pretend we're better than we are and live forever with his, the light of his presence diminished. And that's why this Thursday we're calling you to join us for this night of confession, corporate confession as a body. You've sent many things in. We're actually getting together as elders tonight to pray over those things and distill them down because there's a lot of repetition and patterns. We're going to distill them for you. And then this Thursday we're coming together as a family for a night of prayer and worship. We're going to pray these things out. We're just going to name the strongholds. We're going to name some of the lies. We're going to name some of the sin. We're going to name some of those thin veneers and some of those facades. We're just going to name them. I have no plan beyond naming them and just coming to Jesus and saying, thank you that you want to heal us. Here's our garbage. And would you start taking it away? And then we want that to become a pattern for us as Jesus people. Why? Because we want joy. All the weight lifted. So set that night aside, Thursday the 28th. Come be a part of this. Set that night aside for abiding. That's your night to abide in Jesus together with your family. It's your God-given calling. We want you to step into it. It's the design he has for your life. We want you to know it, but you have to lay down your light first. The light of his presence will be restored in his church as we humble ourselves and return to him. 
as our first love. So as we go to the bread and the wine, let's remember from where we've fallen. Let's humble ourselves, acknowledge our sin, and let's let him take, take it all and just give us his life. This is his pleasure. It's his delight. And Father, I thank you that you look at your children with delight. I thank you that you delight in us. I thank you that the gospel and the blood of your son and his substitutionary death, this atonement was so powerful that now people like us, Lord, you look at us in your son covered in that blood transferred to that, to your kingdom. You look at us even with the chains that we've continued to clutch to and hang on to and the, the slavery that we've used in our freedom to choose again and again. You look at us and you delight in us. I thank you that the gospel is that powerful. And Lord, I pray for your spirit to right now come and just affirm what it is that you're saying to your body. Whatever you're saying, Lord, whatever's been of me, take it away. Whatever's from you, may it land, may it be fruitful, and may we be fruitful. May we be satisfied, all of our fears stilled. May our wills become, become yours. May we live in your name, Jesus. And may we come to you and ask for whatever we wish. And as we're transformed into your image, Lord, would you give us our heart's desire as your people? Have your way with what's yours in Jesus' name. Amen.